Welcome back designers. In today's tutorial, I will be reviewing a few different prompts you may expect to see on the multiple choice section of the Adobe Photoshop 2023 certification test. If you're interested in any of the Photoshop practice files that I created and step-by-step -step video tutorials, please check out the video description, which is going to take you to my Teachers Pay Teacher store where you have access to a full study guide and several other study guides to help you ace the Adobe Photoshop certification test. Without further ado, let's take a look at a few of these prompts. One question specifically asked you to define copyright. There's really nothing that I can demonstrate to show copyright, except giving you the definition off Webster. Copyright is defined as the exclusive legal right to reproduce, publish, sell, or distribute any kind of literary, musical, or artistic work. Intellectual property is a term that's used to refer to any literary, musical, or artistic work. You're going to be asked to define several different image categories, including the process of resampling an image, the difference between a raster and a vector file, and how a raster and a bitmap are related. So let me show you a few different things that you're going to need to know. Here on Photoshop, you can see that I have a raster file open. A raster file means that it's basically made out of pixels. So if I zoom in on any one given petal in this flower, you can see all of the little dots of color that make up that individual petal are called pixels. Raster and bitmap files, the term can be used interchangeably, are made out of pixels. And it's what Photoshop uses to do most of its image editing. A vector file, on the other hand, does not rely on pixels. This is a file that I opened in Illustrator, and if I zoom in anywhere on this fish, you're not going to see a single pixel anywhere, because vector files re rely on mathematical formulas that are going to produce solid areas of color, solid lines, and they're not going to have any problems when you try to resize them, whether to make them larger or smaller because they do not rely on pixels. Photoshop does not deal with vector files. To deal with a vector file, you would need to use an Illustrator program or something similar to Illustrator. Going back to Photoshop, you can see that we have a text layer. Technically, the text layer can be resized without any penalties similar to a vector file. But let's say, for example, that I have a font that people are not going to find as easily on their computers. Let's say it's a fancy cursive font similar to this. So if I'm going to go and share this file, what I might want to consider doing before I share it is to rasterize this text layer so that people are still able to see what I intended, this fancy cursive style font, but they're not going to be prompted to change the font. So what I can do is I can right click on the actual type layer and I can select rasterize type and in rasterizing this type I'm basically converting it from a vector to bitmap or raster file so I'm no longer able to edit the actual properties of the text but I'm still able to see it exactly as I intended you might also be asked to resample an image resample an image basically means that you are changing the number of pixels in the image to know how many pixels I have in this image, I can go to the image menu at the top of my workspace. I can select image size, and I can see that right now this image is 1,366 pixels by 768 pixels wide. Under Fit 2, I can select different options for how I might want to go and resize or resample this image. So if I want to make it smaller, I can select, for example, 960 by 640 pixels, click OK, and you guys are going to see that I basically just resampled or made the pixel amount of the image smaller. So when you're asked to identify these th different categories, resampling versus vectorizing, rasterizing, and so forth, keep in mind what I just demonstrated. Resampling means you're changing the amount of pixels. A vector is a file that does not deal with pixels. Rasterizing means that you're going to convert a vector file into a pixel-based image. And bitmap is just another way of saying that 
the image has pixels. You're also going to be asked to define several different terms related to topography. You're going to be asked to define the process of adjusting the leading or the line spacing in between multiple lines of text. You're going to be asked to define the process of kerning a text layer, tracking text layer, and adjusting the baseline of a text layer. So let's take a look at what each of these categories mean. We're going to take a look at the process of adjusting the baseline on a text layer. You can see that I wrap this text around the ellipse and the text is basically overlapping the ellipse, which looks sloppy. If we look at the descender, or basically the tail end of the G, it's completely overlapping the ellipse, and I want to avoid that. So what I can do is using my type tool, I can highlight the text, open up my character panel, and adjust the baseline. The baseline is basically the line where all the characters sit. Right now the baseline is set to zero points, but if I type in 20 points and hit enter, for example, you can see how I'm adjusting the space considerably so that now the text is no longer touching the ellipse at all. You can make the ellipse space between the text tighter by adjusting the baseline. You can also kind of eyeball it by dragging over the baseline and making the space a little bit wider. For the moment, I'm gonna leave it at 20 points. In this artboard, you can see that I have a multi-line text layer. So what I want to do is actually adjust the space in between these lines of text. This is called the leading. It's spelled the way that you would spell leading with L-E-A-D. But in topography, that word is pronounced leading. So once again, using my type tool, I'm going to go and highlight the text. And the leading is found right over here in my character panel. It's set to auto right now, which means that the space is fairly uniform, but I can go and click on the drop down menu and add a lot of space, setting it to 72 points, for example. Oh, in that case, actually, it's going to tighten it because it's set to 100 points. So if I set it to 300 points, you can see how I added significantly more space in between the lines of text so that there's like a big old gap right there. For space reasons, you can also adjust the letting, make it tighter. So if I go and set it to, for example, 60 points, you can see how it's way too tight and the S right over here overlaps with the M and the A, so it's a little bit sloppy. More often than not, you're not really going to adjust this, you're just going to leave it at auto. But for the certification test, you do need to know how to fix the letting and also how to define it. You're also going to need to know how to adjust the tracking on a text layer. Tracking refers to the space, the uniform space in between all of the letter forms. So I'm actually going to go and eliminate cat and I'm just going to leave the word kitty, highlight it with my type tool, and in my character panel I can find the tracking right over here where it says VA. Right now it's set to zero so all of the letter forms are evenly spaced, but I can go and increase it to 200 points for example. And you can see how I added significantly more space in between each letter form. This could be kind of cool for a title, for example, on a movie poster, where you add quite a lot of space to make it really distinctive. You do want to avoid something like this, where all the letter forms are squished together. Again, for the purposes of the certification test, you're going to be asked to identify what tracking means and potentially to adjust the tracking on any given word. You might also be asked to identify kerning. Kerning means that you're basically adding space in between only two letter forms instead of the whole word uniformly. So if I go and insert my cursor in between the K and the I, I can go right over here, right underneath my point size, adjust the kerning, and I can increase the space in between only those two letter forms instead of applying it directly through the word automatically. So, once again, on the certification test, you'll be asked to define leading, the line spacing, kerning, the space between only two characters, tracking, the space across all characters uniformly, and the baseline, which is the line where all the characters are basically sitting in that text layer. On the test, you'll also be asked to distinguish the difference between patterns and brushes. So one of the questions might ask you, how can you fill text with a repeating motif? That is basically a pattern. 
So let me show you how you would do that. Photoshop already has several patterns that are pre-installed into your program. If I wanted to fill this water text layer with a pattern that looked like water, all I would have to do is utilize my effects, select pattern overlay, and there's several different pattern categories that are already included by default that are nature-based. I'm going to look under the folder that says water, select any one of these, and you can go and adjust the scale depending on how much detail you want to see within that repeating pattern. So when it's asking you how can you fill a text layer or any other kind of layer with a repeating motif, it's basically referring to how you would use patterns within Photoshop. You're definitely going to get a question on the Adobe Certification Test that's going to ask you where you can locate vector shapes on Photoshop. Vector shapes can include custom shapes that look like animals, boats, trees, flowers, and so forth, in addition to basic geometric shapes like circles, rectangles, and so forth. So if it's asking you how to locate a particular vector shape, here's how you can find it. In this layer, you can see that I have the word kangaroo written at the bottom. So I want to place an image of a kangaroo on top. And instead of dragging out a random image from the internet, I'm actually going to be using one of the custom shapes that are available within Photoshop. So I'm going to be using my shape tool and I'm going to right click on my shape tool. I'm going to select custom shape tool here in the options bar. I'm going to have several different libraries of shapes to select from. You may be asked to look under the boats category, flowers category, trees, and so forth. I'm going to be looking under the category called wild animals, and I'm going to be looking for the kangaroo. Having selected it, I can just go drag. If I hold down shift, it can be a really symmetrical shape and create that kangaroo. Then I can go and fill it with any other color that I might want. You may or may not be asked to create a shape in the way that I just did but you're 100% going to be asked to identify where you can find them. So the answer would be to look under your custom shapes and look under the different libraries of shapes that are currently available within Photoshop. You're also going to be asked how you can export multiple layers from one document as separate PNG files. That means that you may have, for example, three to four layers and you have to export each layer as a separate ping file. Let me show you how you can do that. Here in this document, you can see that I have three separate layers, the yellow layer, pink layer, and orange layer, and they all comprise this one flower. So what I want to do is I want to export each layer as a separate file in and of itself. To do so, I can go to the file menu at the top of my workspace. I can select export and the option that says layers to files. For the moment, I'm just going to go and select my desktop as the destination, and I'm going to call this file practice. Then underneath it, you're going to select whatever file type you prefer. So if the test is asking you to export them as JPEGs, you would select JPEGs. I do recall them specifically mentioning ping files. You're going to select run, and Photoshop is going to start blinking as a way to process the data in each of these layers. When you get this message, you're able to preview the files and see that, that they were exported correctly. So if I flip through each and every one of these files, I can see that each layer that comprised a big flower was properly exported as a ping file. The black behind the color is basically the transparency in the image. So once again, the process is to go to File, Export, Layers to Files, and make sure you're selecting the proper file type. There's 100% a question that's going to ask you to identify the different styles that you can use to create a gradient. There's about four different styles that you're going to be asked to identify on the test, but I'm going to show you five of them today on Photoshop. For the first gradient, I'm going to show you how to create a linear gradient style. We're going to be using the gradient tool. In the options bar, after selecting the gradient tool, you can select different color combinations to use for your gradient. I'm just going to leave it at this very pretty pink and teal. And right next to the color combination options, you have several different linear, radial, angle, reflected, and diamond styles to choose from. So I'm going to select the very first one, which is linear. When I click and drag, you're going to see that the gradual blend between colors is taking place kind of like a linear fashion looking horizontal. 
In the second artboard, I'm going to show you how you can create a radial gradient. One more time, I'm selecting my gradient tool. I'm going to select the second style, which is a radial gradient. And if you click from the center and work your way outwards, you can see how the gradient color spreads out, kind of like a flower or a seashell, where it radiates from the center and outwards. The third style is called an angle or angular gradient. It's actually my least favorite, but you can click and drag and you can see a more harsh division of colors. So if I go and tilt the direction of the gradient, you can see how there's a very clear division between the pink and the teal towards the bottom of the gradient, creating a very severe angle. The fourth gradient style is called reflected and it looks very similar to the linear gradient. It can be used to create kind of a linear style horizontally as I was doing before, or if I tilt it and place it kind of vertically, you can see how it kind of creates like a ray of sun or something emanating towards the middle and outwards. And finally, we come to the last style, which is diamond. Similar to a radial gradient, if you click in the middle and spread outwards, you can see how the color is going to spread kind of like a rose petals spreading from the middle and towards the outer edges of your artboard. The only difference is that instead of a circle, it's going to look kind of like diamond shaped. As I tilt it, I can select different angles that I can set these gradients to be. So in summary, these are the five gradient styles. This is linear, radial, angle, reflected, and diamond. On the cert test, you'll be asked how you can alter the transparency of a layer without altering its layer effects. What that means is if I have a text layer and it has, for example, a drop shadow, how can I make the text layer invisible but keep the drop shadow still visible, give it a ghostly three-dimensional appearance? So let me show you how you can do that. Here on Photoshop, you can see I have a text layer called Cookie and this text layer has a drop shadow applied to it. You can see the cookie layer has been filled with a soft pink and what I wanna do is make the soft pink invisible but I still want to be able to see this shadow that's been applied to the layer. So what I can do is I can make the layers fill 0%. So the default is 100. I'm going to set it to 0, which is going to give it this weird, ghostly, three-dimensional appearance because I can still see the three-dimensional aspect with the shadow, but the actual text layer no longer has a fill color. So again, all you would have to do is change the fill from 100 to 0 in order to alter the transparency of the layer and still keep the layer effect visible. As in every version of the Adobe Photoshop certification test, you'll be asked to distinguish between destructive and non-destructive editing techniques. You're going to have a question that's going to have you identify which layer demonstrates evidence of non-destructive editing. If we look at this document on Photoshop, you can see that underneath all of these layers, I have a solid color fill layer, I have a basic raster image, and on top, I have a black and white adjustment layer. These two layers do not have any edits to them whatsoever. The black and white adjustment is evidence of non-destructive editing. Why? It does not affect the layer underneath it if I were to make it invisible. What that means is I didn't apply the black and white directly to the rose layer. It's on a separate layer, so I can easily toggle the visibility on and off as I change my mind. It also has evidence of a mask, and masking is a non-destructive technique. So if I want to reveal the color of the rose, but I want the rest of the image to be black and white, for example, I can click inside of this mask, use my brush tool, use black as my color, and start masking out parts of the adjustment that I no longer want visible. If I make a mistake going into the green areas where I meant to have only the pink and red areas, I can flip to white as my color and mask the adjustment back in as necessary. So both the black and white adjustment layer and the mask that comes automatically with the black and white adjustment layer is evidence of non-destructive editing because it does not apply edits directly to the original image layer and you can easily correct your mistakes throughout the editing process.
Lastly, you can expect to see some questions having to do with project management. You may be asked to define a target audience, the purpose of a project, and the purpose of deadlines. The target audience is basically the people who are meant to see your design, and the target audience is going to include demographic information such as the age range of your audience, gender, economic levels, education levels, and so forth. The project's purpose is a very clear goal about what the project is meant to achieve, whether, for example, it's a public service announcement that is meant to inform teens about the dangers of vaping, or it's meant to be a flyer advertising a concert that's going to be taking place this weekend. That is the purpose of the project. And deadlines, that should be fairly clear. When is the project due? When do you need to have it in to your client? So I hope this information has been helpful to you in reviewing several of the multiple choice prompts you may expect to see on the Adobe Photoshop certification test for the 2023 edition. If you're interested in any of the sample files or in any of the video tutorials that were made specifically for this resource, please check out the video description below, which is going to take you to my Teachers Pay Teachers store, and you can go and purchase a study guide there, in addition to several other study guides to help you ace the Adobe certification test. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for further videos to help you in your certification endeavors. For the moment, peace out, my friends.